Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today, we are going to have a look at the capabilities of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, better known as NATO. Now, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, over the course of the Russian-Ukrainian war, that NATO has shown its resilience, that it is a viable, quote-unquote, defensive organization. But I want to delve deeper. I want to try and get past what the mainstream media is saying and look at whether this is fact or is it a partial false narrative. Now, undoubtedly, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and its member client states, Germany, France, United Kingdom, United States, Poland, Italy, Spain, on and on, have great wealth. And with that wealth comes advanced technology with the support of the United States as well. So first, who is the most powerful member of NATO if you pull back the United States. And I think hands down, most would say, in terms of military capability, in terms of military size, is not even a country in Europe. Well, maybe you could say it's partly in Europe, but that would be the Turks. So the Turkish military is much bigger and much better equipped than most of the Central European powers. I don't know what I mean by that is Germany, France, the United Kingdom. The Turkish Air Force is very large. Its ground forces are, are very large. If you look at the combined, say for instance, tank forces of both Germany and France, you're looking at about 400 tanks. Some of those are even of, of questionable operational capability, according to German standards at least. So at least on the surface, in terms of technology and the ability to, I would say, support the Ukrainians in terms of handing over advanced equipment, the NATO alliance is, uh, is, is proving itself at least as having the ability to hand over large amounts of equipment and train Ukrainian forces in Western Europe. But the problem is for, for NATO is if there was a large-scale conflict, and that obviously would be against the Russian Federation, how would NATO forces fare? Obviously, NATO and the NATO states, Germany, France, if there ever were to be a large-scale Third World War against the Russian Federation, they would have to rapidly expand the size of their, of their ground forces. So essentially, right now, the German army is, is just over 60,000 personnel and strength, and about 200 tanks. The French army, just over 100,000, 110,000 ground force personnel. Again, about 200 tanks. And the United Kingdom is about 70,000, 80,000 ground forces. And again, 100 to 200 tanks. So not a very large ground component to these, what you would call the mainstay of, of NATO. Now, as we look further east, in all probability, the most powerful member of NATO, probably 
future facing is going to be Poland. They may eventually surpass the Turks in, in terms of, of capability. The Polish military right now, the Polish army is about 70,000 strong, but fairly well equipped. That is going to rapidly expand. The Polish military is going to have an end strength possibly up out to 2030, maybe sooner, of about 300,000 personnel, and probably 150,000 of that will be in the actual ground forces. Now, the Poles are on a armed equipment shopping spree right now. They look to purchase hundreds of U.S. M1 A2s. They're going to purchase and produce on their own the uh, South Korean K-2 uh, Black Panther main battle tank. They're going to purchase F-35 twos. Oh, I'm sorry, F-35 Lightning twos. About 100 Apache uh, helicopter gunships. They're going to purchase South Korean light attack aircraft. They already have about 40 F-16s. They're going to purchase hundreds of multiple launch rocket systems from the South Koreans. They're going to purchase HIMARS from the United States. So by the end of this, the Polish armed forces are going to be almost as large as the armed forces of Turkey. Plus, they're going to have about a thousand very advanced main battle tanks, over a thousand main battle tanks, if they end up purchasing all those main battle tanks from South Korea and establish a production facility inside of Poland. So it'll be very interesting to see what things look like going out to 2030. Now, the big issue with NATO, and if you, if you consider that the Turks are the preeminent power of NATO, if there, let's say, was to be a war, let's say between, and I've talked about this before, maybe the Russian Federation and uh, there's a conflict between Estonia and Russia or the Baltic states and Russia, would in fact Turkey come to the aid as a NATO member of the Baltic states. And I don't think they would. I do not believe they would. Now, as long as the Russians are fighting the Ukrainians and all NATO has to do is supply bombs, supply weapon systems, and train Ukrainian forces, I do believe NATO is effective at that. But if it comes to the actual loss of life, meaning Russian forces are attacking targets in Germany, Russian tanks are rolling into the Baltic states, that's going to change things. I don't know if the wherewithal of the German state, of the French state, is going to have the appetite to fight the Third World War. Especially if you consider something that kicks off between, say, Estonia and Russia. Are the Germans going to send forces over Poland into the Baltic states to save the Baltics? I don't know. You have to question that. Do the Germans even have that capability? Again, at least on the surface, especially in terms of what's happening in Ukraine right now, the Germans, the NATO alliance, the French, are prove, proving somewhat worthy in helping the Ukrainians. But again, this is just the supply of arms and training. Again, if this changes, if we start to see actual missiles flying 
and hitting Berlin and hitting Hamburg, which would happen, again, I believe, with the lack of warrior culture in Germany, that we would start to see 100, 200, 300,000 Greenpeace, Green Party protesters tearing down Berlin, tearing down different German cities, demanding a pullout of the NATO alliance. Especially if the heat gets cut off and bombs start falling on Germany. I'm not so sure the wherewithal would continue. But I could be wrong. Again, supplying weapons and equipment to Ukraine and training Ukrainian forces to have them then ship back to Ukraine and, and whatever happens, happens. <clears throat> but again, an actual war where German soldiers are fighting in the Baltics or fighting possibly in Belarus... I think that's going to look different. Much different. And I think that's why right now we're seeing what the polls are doing. I'm not so sure the polls see NATO as a viable alliance in the distant future. That's why you see this massive military buildup by the polls. And again, it's, it's, it's significant. Again, Poland will probably have the most powerful military in the European theater by, uh, by 2030. Who would have thunk it, huh? But again, just wanted to uh, have a conversation about that. Again, I believe just because what we're seeing now doesn't mean that if all hell breaks loose and we go into the Third World War, that you will see this effective, unified alliance. Again, supplying weapons to Ukraine, supplying training to Ukraine, supplying intelligence to Ukraine is much different than actually than eating KH-47 hypersonic missiles hitting your capital. Just saying. Anyway, we'll have more. Thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Have a good day.